I would like to go over five things we focused on last year. Accident causes and measures taken following the earthquake and tsunami. Uh, number two, circulating water cooling. Number three, mitigation of radioactive emissions. Number four, preparation for future events, countermeasures against earthquakes and tsunamis. And number five, uh, miscellaneous, environmental improvements, etc. I'd like to start by going over the impact due to the Tohoku Chiho Pacific Ocean earthquake. As shown in the lower right figures, the Tohoku Chiho Pacific Ocean Earthquakes epicenter extended over quite a large area, 200 kilometers from east to west and 500 kilometers from north to south. That is to say, a seismic chain reaction occurred across the following regions, off the Sandiku coastline, off the coast of Miyagi Prefecture, close to the Japan Trench in the southern Sandiku offshore, off the coast of Fukushima Prefecture, and off the coast of Ibaraki Prefecture. The earthquake had a magnitude of 9.0, which was the fourth biggest observed earthquake in the history of the world. This table shows the seismic impact due to the earthquake. In the yellow boxes, the actual impact exceeded the design basis ground motion. However, in most parts, the impact was below the design basis ground motion. When the earthquake struck Fukushima Daiichi, all control rods were inserted into the reactor core, leading to an automatic shutdown that stopped the critical reaction. After that, although off-site power was lost, electricity was supplied via the emergency diesel generators. This plant data shows that until the tsunami struck the power station, the plant was operating normally. We conducted an analysis of how much stress the plant structures and components, etc., incurred by using an actual seismometer record. Since the results show that the seismic intensity did not exceed the earthquake tolerance level of the structures and components by a wide margin, we concluded that the earthquake was not the cause of the facility damage and deformation. Although we do not have a detailed grasp of the inside conditions of the reactors, we haven't found any damage to uh, any equipment integral to plant safety. For example, page 17 shows pictures of the inside of the Unit 2 PCV taken via an industrial endoscope. We found that the piping and other structures were in good condition. As for the Unit 1 isolation condenser, at the initial stages of the accident, we thought that the IC pumping was ruptured. However, our observations of the outside piping leading to the PCV from the second, third, and fourth floor revealed that they were in good condition, although some of the insulating materials covering the pipes had peeled off due to the explosion. Hence, we believe that the IC was functioning without any problems after the earthquake. This page affirms our conclusion regarding the impact the earthquake had on the nuclear power station. We believe that the earthquake itself didn't have any impact to any of the equipment vital to the safety functions of the plant, specifically the stop, cooling, and containment functions. After the tsunami arrived, units 1 to 4 were struck by 11.5 to 15.5 meter high tsunamis, and units 5 and 6 were struck by 13 to 14.5 meter high tsunamis. This rendered the seawater pumps inoperable, which are necessary to discharging heat generated in the reactors into the sea. Following this, seawater broke into the turbine buildings, resulting in the flooding of the emergency diesel generators and power panels. After the off-site power was lost, the emergency diesel generators kicked in to temporarily supply electricity to the power station. However, the blue-colored DGs and the power panels indicated by the blue crossbar crossbars were rendered inoperable due to flooding, resulting in the loss of all AC, DC, and emergency power. 
As a result, units 1 to 3 lost their reactor cooling function, which is what led to the accident. We verified that each reactor core in units 1, 2, and 3 were damaged on March 11th, 12th, and the 13th, respectively. Initially, we used fire engines to inject water into the reactors to cool them down. After that, we installed motor pumps to reinforce the water injection facilities. From late March of last year, we were able to inject water into the reactors using motor pumps. In addition, we installed backup facilities, implemented measures to improve hose reliability, and diversified the power sources. Next, we turned to dealing with the highly contaminated water that had accumulated inside the building. First, we used fresh water to cool down the reactors. This water leaked from the damaged parts of the RPV and PCV to the ground floors of the reactor buildings and turbine buildings where it became contaminated. Given the dangers this contaminated water posed to the restoration work and the environment, we had to come up with countermeasures. However, we were unable to stop the leakage of the highly contaminated water to the intakes of Units 2 and 3 in time. After the leakage, we began the construction of the circulating water cooling system starting with the water processing facilities. We transferred the accumulated water from the reactor and turbine buildings to the processing main building and the calcinator building, then the uh, cesium adsorption apparatus, Curion and Sari, and the de decontamination apparatus, Arriva, uh, began the process of removing the radioactive materials from the water. Following this, the water was uh, desalinated and stored in tanks. This water was used for reactor water injection. This enables us to kill two birds with one stone because we can mitigate contaminated water leakage risks while also being able to create fresh water for reactor water injection. By around August to September, the RPV and PCV temperatures steadily declined and leveled off to below 100 degrees Celsius. In February, although some undue anxiety unfortunately ensued due to the malfunctioning thermometer in the RPV, stable cold shutdown conditions are being maintained. In August, since the start of operations of the second cesium absorption apparatus, SARI, we have been able to steadily process the accumulated water in the turbine buildings. Currently, the groundwater level is being maintained at uh, OP 3000 millimeters. Thus, we believe that we are successfully minimizing leakages to the environment. Although we are controlling the water level inside the buildings, in 2014 we will construct water shielding walls at the seaside front of units 1 to 4 in order to prevent contaminated water that may unexpectedly leak from inside the building to the underground water from making its way into the ocean. Radioactive emissions from the nuclear power station have steadily declined and the work environment has improved. The airborne radioactivity concentration has not increased since last summer. Currently, the rate of decline is small, and we can detect the radioactive materials deposited on the grounds and vegetation that was released when the building exploded or from other causes. The latest release rate of radioactive materials from the reactor buildings is 0.01 billion becquerels per hour. This is 180 millionth the amount at the time of the accident. At the site boundaries, the airborne radioactivity density is below the legal limit. In fact, the density has been consistently far below the 10% legal limit, which requires the wearing of full face masks. Therefore, although we had to wear full face masks and Tyvex when moving between the main anti-earthquake building and J-Village, such requirements have since been lightened. Radioactive particle density in the seawater has steadily decreased. 
On March 5th, 2012, the radiation dose at the main anti-earthquake building dropped from 380 microsieverts per hour detected on March 15th, 2011 to 1.2 microsieverts per hour. Due to such environmental enhancements, female workers have now joined their male counterparts to engage in the radiation recovery work. This slide shows the seismic analysis of the buildings. In order to verify if these structures would be able to withstand future big earthquakes, we conducted assessments in accordance with the design basis earthquake ground motion concept. In addition, we conducted a computer earthquake simulation taking the buildings that had exploded at units 1, 3, and 4 into consideration. As a result, we confirmed that the simulation results were much lower than the evaluation criterion of 4 times 10 to the negative third power. As for Unit 4, there are concerns that the water might leak from the spent fuel pool, as well as concerns that the building might tilt. We installed steel supports and concrete at the bottom of the spent fuel pool, which enhanced its strength by 20% compared to the previous analysis. Furthermore, we investigated the water surface and confirmed that the building had not tilted. In addition, we inserted an underwater camera inside the pool and confirmed that there were no abnormalities in the spent fuels and fuel racks. We believe that if a magnitude 8 class aftershock occurs, a 7 to 8 meter tsunami will strike the power station from the southeast. Therefore, we will install a temporary tide barrier at the area marked by the pink dotted line to prevent the tsunami. We have, in, we have established multiple backup facilities for the reactor water injection. Currently, we are using the regular upland reactor water injection pump. As a backup, we have four other pumps. Uh, emergency upland reactor water injection pump, fresh water tank reactor water pump, turbine building reactor water injection pump, and CST reactor water injection pump. In addition, we have deployed more than 10 fire engines. We also installed multiple water sources. We are able to receive off-site power from Okuma Lines 2, 3, and 4, uh, Yonomori Lines 1 and 2, and a line from Tohoku Electric Company. We also deployed power supply cars to the site. In addition, by the end of this March, we will restore a diesel generator in the shared pool building. Since the workers are toiling under very harsh conditions, we have established an emergency medical room at Units 5 and 6 and have assigned a doctor to be on-site 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Uh, we have also set up on-site rest stations that can accommodate up to 1,800 people at once. In addition, the radioactive rubble is being removed to improve the safety of the work environment. Finally, I'd like to talk about our mid- and long-term decommissioning goals. In Phase 1, we will begin removing the spent fuels from the spent fuel pool within two years. Starting from the end of December, our first target is to start removing fuels from Unit 4. In addition, we are implementing countermeasures to maintain radiation dosage levels at the site boundaries to below 1 millisieverts per year, including the radiation emitted from other sources such as the rubble and waste vessels. We deeply apologize to all residents of Fukushima Prefecture as well as broader society for the concern and anxiety that has arisen on account of the accident at Fukushima Daiichi Nuclear Power Station. We will continually focus our efforts to maintain cold shutdown conditions and address the issues towards the decommissioning over the mid to long term.